Oh, loving Father, we recognize this evening that all of us are prone to wonder. We pray tonight by your Holy Spirit, as we come to your word, you might draw us back. You might convict us and lead us to repentance that we might come back to you and enjoy your embrace. Be at work in our hearts and in our lives, we pray. Take these gifts that have been given now and through the week and use them to call others to turn to you, that many more might put their trust in Jesus Christ and know what it is to be loved by you, our Heavenly Father. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, please do uh, take a seat uh, and please keep your Bibles open at Hosea chapter 14. It was a warm, sunny day in central London. Uh, My wife and I had an appointment to get to. We had plenty of time, but we didn't know how to get to our destination. I got my phone out to look up the directions. It's that way, I said confidently, and started walking. About three steps later, I realized it wasn't that way. I kept walking. A few steps further on, I thought I should probably say something. We're going the wrong way, I said. It's that way. My wife stopped and turned round. I kept walking. Even though I knew I was going the wrong way, even though I knew I should be going that way instead, still, I kept walking. Eventually, I saw a little tree planted in the pavement. I skirted round it, (laughs) caught up with my wife, and carried on walking the way we should always have gone. Over the next few weeks in our evening services, we're going to be uh, looking at various postures in Scripture Various ways of of positioning ourselves, of of moving ourselves, uh, that reveal something about our relationship with our Creator God. That reveal something about His relationship with us. And I have to say that I think this evening's posture is by far the most difficult of the lot. Uh, Not because it's some uh, complex gymnastic position achieved only through years of training and conditioning. No, Uh, no, rather because it's a move that gets to the very heart of why we sometimes struggle with the Bible. Of why we sometimes struggle with the claims that God makes on our lives. It is a move that challenges us to our very This evening, we're going to see what the Bible has to say about turning. Turning. Uh, And very often, uh, just like me in London the other week, I think we find turning very difficult. Not physically tricky, but emotionally and spiritually demanding. Turning involves recognizing that we're heading in the wrong direction. Acknowledging that there is a better way to go. And then, crucially, being able to set aside our pride to actually turn, to actually change. I find that hard to do when the stakes are as low as looking a little silly for walking the wrong way. It's a whole lot harder when the turn involved is one that concerns the core, fundamental direction of our whole lives. That is probably the hardest move that the scriptures ask us to make. But that call to turn 
is also probably one of the clearest we will see in the pages of this book. Let's read again from the beginning of Hosea chapter 14. Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. These words come right at the end of the book of Hosea. And it's a book that catalogues the failures of ancient Israel. Particularly their failure to be God's people. In vivid terms, God describes through his prophet how the people of ancient Israel have betrayed him. As they've looked elsewhere to idols and and false gods instead of to him, the true and living God. But Hosea didn't just proclaim this tragic truth. No, he lived it. At God's command, he married a woman known for her unfaithfulness. Go, marry a promiscuous woman, Hosea is told in chapter 1. Go, marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Hosea does as he was commanded, and the rest of the book tells the story of his heart-rending pleas for his wife to return to him, of his commitment and love for her, despite her repeated adultery. But more than that, the book tells the story of Yahweh's undeserved, but nonetheless unwavering love for his people despite their continued spiritual adultery, despite their repeated wanderings to other gods and other powers, still God loves them. Still God pleads for them to return. With all the passion and emotion of a heartbroken husband longing for reconciliation, so Yahweh calls to his people, Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. And it's not just Hosea. This call rings out throughout the pages of Scripture. That word, return, it occurs on average more than once per chapter in the Old Testament. Variously translated as as return, turn back, turn away, or, or simply turn. And nowhere is it more evident than in the prophets as as God calls his people, turn, turn, turn. Jeremiah alone uses the word 115 times. And then in the New Testament, well, well, the language changes, but the idea is the same. Repentance becomes the call. A term meaning to to change one's mind, to alter one's trajectory, to turn. As Jesus steps onto the scene in the Gospels, uh, what is his call? Repent. Repent. Turn, for the kingdom of God is close at hand. This, This movement, this turning, is central to the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. But what does it look like? What does it actually involve? Well, let's read on in Hosea from verse 1 again. Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously, that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Tim Chester has called these verses a liturgy of turning. And they show us quite beautifully what it means biblically to turn. First, we see that this is a turn to God. Return to the Lord is the call to the people of God. Not some aimless, haphazard spinning around, but rather a very deliberate very targeted turn to the Lord. And 
that involves a recognition that the way we are going is wrong. The direction we are headed in can never lead to life. Your sins have been your downfall, we hear. The whole call to turn is rooted in the reality that we need to turn. That was my experience that day in London. However confident I'd been when we set off, it wasn't long until I had to acknowledge, even if only to myself, that I'd set off in the wrong direction. I could have walked all day that way. I'd never have got to where I wanted to go. And maybe that's been your experience too. How often have we known that feeling of setting off confidently? Being sure we're right. Only to begin all too soon. To have a sneaking suspicion We might have been wrong all along. You know, I I think we're in that moment as a society in the West right now. We set off so confidently at the turn of the 20th century. Certain uh, that we could do this. That we could navigate life and, and the world and meaning and purpose all by ourselves. God is dead, the philosophers had declared just a few years before. And so we thought we'd have a crack at it by ourselves. We'll be all right, we thought. Well, I wonder if we're beginning to just see the the seeds of doubt creeping in. There seems to have been a a temperature shift in recent years in the conversation about our self-sufficiency. I wonder if we've just begun to realize uh, that our collective materialistic, pleasure-seeking, wealth-obsessed approach maybe is not all we hoped it might be. I wonder if we've begun just to have a sneaking suspicion that we might be heading in the wrong direction, that we might need to turn after all. And I wonder if you've known that feeling personally too. Even as someone who's been a a Christian for many years, I still find myself regularly heading off after the riches of this world. Maybe recognition, the praise of others, or financial security, or sexual experience, or most often, just my own comfort, my own selfish desire for personal satisfaction. And it's in those moments that that we need to feel this discomfort, this sneaking suspicion that we're going the wrong way, that we need to turn. But it's not enough just to feel that. No, Uh, look at what it says in verse 2. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Take words with you with you. The call in scripture is to verbalize our recognition that we're going the wrong way. To to allow it to take a more concrete form uh, than merely a feeling, a suspicion. You see, that day in London, it was only really, as I said to my wife, we're going wrong, it's that way, that I really began to believe it for myself. As I gave voice to the inkling that I'd begun to suspect, so the action that I needed to take became more solid. So the truth of my error became clear. And so friends, if you've known that sneaking suspicion, that uncomfortable hunch, then let me encourage you this evening to put it into words to verbalize your realization that you're heading the wrong way. Come to the Lord. Turn to the Lord and say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit 
of our lips. Maybe you've never done that before. Spoken to God of of your realization that you need to turn, that you need his forgiveness. Or maybe you have. Perhaps first many years ago. But this is not just a a one-time call because this is not just a one-time wandering. The clue's there in that final line. Receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. That means that our, our words might not be just words, but rather that what our lips say might be seen in fruit in our lives. Because the reality is that we are all prone to wonder. Even if once we've turned, we will so often stray off root again. We will need to turn again. And again. And again. The great theologian of the 16th century, Martin Luther, put it like this. He said, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he meant that the entire life of believers should be one of repentance. So often do we stray from the way we should go that we will our entire lives find ourselves needing to turn again. To turn again to God. But not only to God, because the second insight we see in these verses is that this is also a turn away from idols. Verse 3, Assyria cannot save us. We will not mount war horses. We will never again say, our gods, to what our own hands have made. For in you the fatherless find compassion. Well, maybe the U.S. has replaced Assyria. And nuclear missiles are more powerful today than war horses. But I think we understand the principle. You see, the turn we're called to is a turn to God and a turn away from idols. Away from whatever it is we were looking to for security and stability instead of the true and living God. Assyria was the the regional superpower in Hosea's day. And war horses, the height of military technology. But to turn to God is to turn away from human might and power as the source of our safety. And the idea of of worshipping statues made by our own hands may seem unfamiliar to us too. But did we not see, as the COVID pandemic swept across the world, that all the property and possessions, all the status and standing, all the titles and training, all of those things that we put so much store by, that we put so much faith in, none of them really made any difference, did they? None of them provided the the sure and certain foundation that we all crave. (laughs) We'll worship all sorts today. And we need to hear the call to turn away from whatever foolish gods our hands have made. You see, that day in London, it wasn't enough for me to feel like I needed to change direction. It wasn't enough even for me to speak that out loud. No, I actually had to turn. I actually had to stop going that way and start going that way. That's the bit we find so hard, isn't it? We are so invested in our idols. Surely more money would actually give me some security. Surely another qualification would would get me to where I want to be. Surely a better work-life balance or or more rest or more time with my family or, or, or a little bit more me time. Surely that would cure the ache I feel for something better. Those are the things we crave. Those are the things we pursue. Those are the things we sacrifice for and devote ourselves to. Those are the idols we worship. Those are the idols we must turn from. 
friends, hear the call of Scripture this evening. Turn. Turn, because not one of those man-made gods will ever really do the job. Not one of those good gifts can ever truly take the place of the one who gives them. Not one of those earthly treasures can ever truly satisfy our deepest longings. Now, friends, turn. Turn because there is something so much better waiting for you when you do. It is only in Yahweh the God of the Bible, it is only in him that the fatherless find compassion. Hear his words from verse 4 onwards. Yahweh says, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. Like a cedar of Lebanon, he will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. People will dwell in his shade again. They will flourish like the corn. They will blossom like the vine. Israel's fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I I'm like a flourishing juniper. Your fruitfulness comes from me. You see, dear friends, here is the wonderful, marvelous, magnificent truth of the gospel of God. If we will but turn, if we will but turn to God and turn from idols, well then we will find great wonder of wonders that God himself has turned towards us. Did you hear the language in those verses? God says that he will heal, he will love, he will refresh like dew in a parched and sunburnt desert. He will cause his people to grow, to bud and blossom, to flourish and fruit. He will answer our cry and he will care. And just look again at the results for the one who turns to him. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like a cedar. People will dwell in his shade. Notice, uh, that's not God's shade here, it's Israel's. The point is that, that there is so much blessing in turning, so much blessing in repentance, that it will overflow to those around us. As the Lord gathers to himself a repentant people, so the whole world will know the relief of resting in their shade. Oh, friends, this is why we turn. Yes, because the direction we were heading in before is leading nowhere good, but also because our new direction brings with it such bountiful blessing, such rich reward. You know, ultimately, what it was that made me turn that day in London was not simply the idea that I was heading the wrong way. That by itself would probably have never been enough to overcome my fear of looking silly. I'm far too stubborn and proud for that. Now what really turned me that day was the fact that what I wanted, what I needed, the reason I was in London in the first place, all of that was not over there. It was over there. And so I turned. And if we will turn to our loving Heavenly Father, to the one who so dearly longs for us to turn, we will find in him all our deepest needs met, all our inmost desires satisfied. Not with the trinkets of this age, the things that we've fashioned with our own hands, no, no, with something so much better. 
we will know healing and love, refreshment and flourishing. We will know our Father turn towards us in loving kindness. How? Well, through the most astonishing turn of all. I wonder, did you hear it? And nestled in there amongst all the other wonderful promises, right at the end of verse 4. I will heal their waywardness, says the Lord, and love them freely for my anger has turned away from them. Our loving Heavenly Father is able to turn His love upon us that it might shine upon us as we turn from idols and turn to Him because He has turned His anger away from us. Not because our sin, our, our waywardness no longer matters. No, He is a holy God. Good and upright, true and righteous. But because his good and perfect wrath has been turned away from us and turned on to his own dear son, Jesus Christ, instead. As he hung on that Roman cross, Jesus Christ bore all the anger that should have fallen on God's people like a water cannon that, that should have knocked us off our feet. Instead, God's wrath was turned on Christ. And he took the full force of God's righteous judgment in our place. He bore it so that we might turn and know forgiveness and welcome, love and peace peace with our Heavenly Father. I don't know how many of you will have seen the film of the children's book, The Railway Children. But there's a beautiful scene right at the end. The story, just in case you don't know it, is, is of three children whose father has been wrongly imprisoned for espionage. Throughout the film, the, the longing of those children to see their father again builds and builds until it becomes an all-consuming ache. Then in the final scene, the eldest child, Roberta, or Bobby as she's known, finds herself on the platform as a steam train pulls into the local station. Now, you can watch this in the 2000 remake of the film, but it's much better in the original 1970 edition. Because in that one, Bobby begins by looking towards the rear of the train. But as it pulls away from the station, she turns. She turns. And there, as the steam clears away, she sees a figure. A man, older than he looked the last time she saw him, but unmistakably him. She runs towards him. And as she does, all the emotion of years apart bursts out. Daddy, she cries, my daddy. As she is enveloped in his warm embrace, Friends, if we will but turn, we will find our Father there. Turn towards us. Ready to smile. Ready to embrace. Not just the first time, but every time. If we will but turn. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us 
from all unrighteousness. Friends, this evening, will you turn? Let's pray. Forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Oh Lord, that is our prayer this evening. Each of us has wandered again and again. And yet we hear this evening your call to turn. We thank you that your anger has turned away from us and turned instead upon your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that because of him, we may now turn to you, knowing that if we turn, we will find our loving Father ready to embrace us. Lord, help us turn by your spirit. Give us the strength to overcome our pride and our folly, our fear of looking silly. Help us turn, we pray. Well, in just a moment, we're going to share communion together. Uh, and maybe you're here this evening and you've never turned to God before. Let me invite you tonight to turn. Turn to God. Turn from your sin. Turn that you might know his anger turned upon Christ instead of you. And that you might know his face turn to smile upon you. Or maybe you've done all that before. But if that's you this evening, then let me invite you to turn again. For this regular meal that we share is a beautiful reminder of our need to constantly recalibrate, to constantly reorientate, to, to recognize that we so easily drift off course and that we need to turn again to our loving Heavenly Father. And to know again, through Jesus Christ, his warm embrace. Turn to him again. For he will receive you. Just as he did before.